Hello, welcome back to uh, Statics Engineering 211, and we wanted—I wanted to uh, pick up where we left off last time, working equilibrium problems, uh, drawing free body diagrams using our equilibrium equations to to solve those and come up with uh, unknown forces and reactions and things like that. So I'd like to start with this problem here, and uh, say that we're given this uh, lift, like you might use to uh, uh, pull the engine out of a car or something. I think sometimes they call them cherry pickers. A uh, little uh, mobile crane, usually on uh, small wheels that uh, you can roll along a concrete or a hard surface floor, and with this hydraulic cylinder that this arm goes up and down. And let's say that we would like to find the uh, pressure in the cylinder. So find the pressure in the cylinder and the uh, forces at pin A. So given that this hydraulic cylinder has a uh, three square inch uh, piston and this uh, point up here A with the included geometry and whatnot, we'd like to find the forces at that uh, pin A and we'd like to find the uh, pressure, the hydraulic pressure in this hydraulic cylinder. So to do that, and we'll talk more about other aspects of this problem when we get that wrapped up, but to do that, I think we'd want to draw a free body diagram of this uh, lifting arm. So let's see if I can uh, do justice for that. So we'd have this uh, pin at A. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, put uh, A Y like this and A X like that. Maybe I'll be right, maybe I'll be wrong, and that uh, will I get negative signs on there? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm going to go ahead and put this 1,000 uh, pound load here. And then at this point where this uh, cylinder connects, I'll put the uh, the force there, F, force of the cylinder. Okay. Um, I've got some uh, geometry there uh, by the picture. We know that this is, and maybe I won't clutter up the free body diagram with it. A lot of times we want to put that on the free body diagram, but to, uh, to kind of keep this neat, maybe I will not put that on there. So we've got it uh, at uh, got access to it uh, over there. Well, one thing that I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to go look at some more geometry and look at this uh, triangle that exists with this uh, cylinder right there. We have a, a triangle that looks then like this, where this would uh, of course be the uh, pin at A, and we'd have 18 inches here and 36 inches there, so 36 and 18, and then we have the uh, cylinder on this side, and this angle in here, this would be, um, it's 30 degrees above horizontal, we of course have a right angle to horizontal, so I could say that this is 120 degrees. So that helps me out, I could uh, go ahead and figure out what this x side is, x is going to turn out to be by the law of cosines, the square root of 18 squared plus uh, 36 squared plus 2, whoops, not plus, minus 2 times 18 times 36 times the cosine of 120. Just barely got that in there. Okay, using the law of cosine. It's a little tight in there, but I uh, should um, be able to reproduce that with a law of cosine. So 2 minus 2 times 18 times 36 times the cosine of that included angle 120 degrees and that X then turns out to be uh, 47.6 inches. And probably the uh, reason for that is so that I can get this angle in here. This is going to be what I really want. I can say then that the uh, sine of alpha divided by the opposite side, 18, is equal to the sine of 120 divided by what we just found, 47.6 uh, inches, and alpha turns out to be equal to uh, 19.1 degrees, or I guess the other option would be about, what, 160 or 159.9, no, 160.9, uh, right, yeah. 
160.9. Well, you take that uh, 160.9, add 120 to it, you're not going to get a triangle. So we know that that is the correct answer. So anytime you use the inverse sine, remember to, to double check your, your work there. Let me uh, double check our calculations. I think we're good. So, yeah. Yeah, so our complement would have been uh, 160.9, add that to 120, and it could not possibly be a triangle. So we know uh, that we're good with that. Now that's actually be going to be uh, kind of important because that gives me this angle here, which is the angle that that is off. So I can break that up if I, if I want to. And I could uh, draw a diagram down here. Put the uh, force of the uh, cylinder here and talk about the x component and the y component, and this is that 19.1. So if I talk about the um, moment about A then, so I sum the uh, moment about A. What am I going to have? Let's see. Moment about A. Setting that equal to zero. And why don't I just go ahead and take clockwise as positive? You could do counterclockwise if you wanted to. I'll take clockwise as positive. So the pieces that I'm going to have, I don't have anything from AX and AY because I'm summing the moments about that point, and that's probably why it's a good point to do that. I don't want to have to deal with those. We'll get those eventually, but I don't know them. So if I do the moment at that point, I can relate this thousand directly to the force in the cylinder. Well, the force in the cylinder has two components. It has a component like this, and it has a component like that. And that would be um, the force in the cylinder times the sine of that 19 degrees. And then we would have over here the force in the cylinder times the cosine of 19 degrees. Okay. Now the other thing we have to think about is this is an inclined angle of what? 30 degrees, right? We have that 30 degrees in there. So if we look at this, I could talk about the force in the uh, cylinder times the sine of 19 degrees, 19.1 if you want. So that's this piece here. What distance does that act through? Well, I have to find that vertical distance there, don't I? Which is going to be 18, this distance here, 18, times what? The uh, sine of 30 degrees. I mean, I have a triangle that looks like this, where this is 18 and this is 30 degrees. So I want this side, that's 18 sine 30 degrees. Now I will have to uh, then add to that. Is that, uh, let's see, which way is that going? That's this way, so that's going to go, that's this one. So we hold this here, and our paper will rotate this way, so it's positive, it's clockwise. Then I'm going to add to that a 1,000. That's that one, and it acts through this total distance, which is going to be what? 18 and 36 is 54. That's where that comes from. 54 comes from 18 plus 36. And I need the horizontal piece, so it'll be cosine of 30 degrees. And then the last thing, so I've done this one, and I've done this one, and now I need to deal with this vertical piece of that. So I will have to subtract off, because it's going to tend to rotate it in the counterclockwise direction, the force in the uh, cylinder times the cosine. We've got the angle defined in here. That's why the vertical piece is cosine. Cosine of 19 degrees, or 19.1 degrees, times the distance that that acts through, which is going to be now that distance, right? Which would be eight, 18 times the cosine of 30. Okay, so I've accounted for that now, that, that, 
those intersect it. Uh, no one has told us about the weight of this arm, so either that was factored into this or it's negligible in comparison. Probably negligible in comparison. The arms are usually not that heavy. Let me double check our work here, make sure we're on the uh, right path. Okay, so when we go through the uh, solution of this, you could uh, solve this equation. You're going to factor a force in the cylinder out and uh, uh, divide things out. That's going to uh, give you, um, you could run through this if you wanted to, the uh, force in the uh, cylinder is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, this will move to the other side. So I'm going to have a thousand times fifty four cosine thirty divided then by cosine nineteen times eighteen times the uh, cosine of thirty minus the uh, sine of nineteen times eighteen times the sine of thirty. Well, I think that's correct. We'll check that cosine 19. Yeah. So our force in the cylinder then is equal to, I think when I ran through this earlier, 3960 pounds. Let me double check that with the calculator give you a chance to uh, you know uh, try and uh, work along with it or you can of course hit the pause button. I don't want to turn this into a calculator class but the, the simple fact is is you probably ought to be able to sit on your calculator and evaluate that and I'll come up with the same answer. So let me run through that again real fast. Yeah, 3960. Yeah. So I think we're okay with that. Now that's the uh, the force in the cylinder. So we'll go to page number uh, two here. I'm going to come back to the C body diagram. Well, if we've got that the uh, force in the cylinder is equal to 3960 uh, pounds, and uh, we know, and those of you that go into hydraulics and uh, fluid systems and whatnot will recognize that uh, pressure is equal to force times the area. So if we look at uh, given a three square inch area, so our, our, the, the piston, usually a round piston, is going to the area of that piston would be uh, 3 square inches. So we could say that we have uh, 3960 pounds divided by 3 square inches, which gives me uh, 1320 PSI, which is certainly a uh, reasonable yeah, 1320 PSI, which is certainly a reasonable uh, number for, for hydraulic pressure. So start looking at a lot of uh, agricultural and industrial systems usually their maximum is around um, 1800 to about 5000 somewhere in that range when you start looking at more compact systems like uh, jaws of life and so other industrial systems too they're, they're running about 10,000 so this is a, a very doable for a hydraulic system these uh, jacks that you get and whatnot usually they're running about 10,000 so this would be uh, quite doable now, what was the other thing that we wanted out of this? We wanted the uh, force here at pin A, didn't we? So let me uh, slide this back over the uh, the top here. And what I want to get out of this is the uh, the free body diagram. So we had the uh, force in the cylinder here. And then if I sum the forces in the x direction, so let's say that I took the x to the right and the y up, 
So I'll say positive to the right, summing the forces in the x direction, setting that equal to zero, what do I have? I have AX plus this piece right there, which is the force in the cylinder. What did we say that was? Force in the cylinder times sine of 19. 19 or 19.1 degrees. So I've got then that, maybe I'll just uh, move this up. I'll work my way up because I've got a little space there. I could say then that AX is equal to minus the force on the cylinder, 3960, 3960 times the sine of 19, which gets me a minus 1289 pounds. I've got too many significant figures there. I'd be better off to tell you, say 1290. Uh, but or s minus 1290. The minus is quite important because if we look at this, it's saying that we really needed this force in the other direction, didn't we? We needed it in that direction, which makes sense because we have this here. If, if this is in this direction and that's in that direction, this thing's going to be accelerating to the right quite rapidly. So it, it should not surprise us that this AX would have to be back that way. So I should probably have a negative sign. Now what should I do about that? Do I want to go back through and change this? No, because then I have to change this diagram and all of the math leading up to that. So I just go ahead and leave my diagram here and then I leave the negative sign there and when you see a negative sign we go, oh well what direction is that? Oh, we took it to the right so we know it really should be to the left. Okay, well let's see how the uh, other one plays out. So if I sum the forces in the y direction, setting that equal to zero. I'll go ahead and take positive up on this, and I will have AY, that's acting up, plus the force in the uh, cylinder times, what is the vertical piece? Cosine of 19. So I've taken care of that one. I've taken care of that one, and I don't want to forget to subtract off that thousand. So I could say then that uh, AY is equal to a thousand minus the force in the cylinder, 3960, times the cosine of 19, which turns out to be equal to minus 2744 pounds. And again, I have too many significant figures. I should call that uh, 2740. A lot of people are then uncomfortable with that, but of course, the magnitude of these numbers, six pounds, should not uh, break the deal. Let me double check those uh, numbers that we've got out there, make sure we're right on this. Yeah. Okay. So we've we've got this. Now, again, this is negative, so it indicates that this would have to really be going in that direction, wouldn't it? Which makes sense. We can think about this load really teetering, almost a teeter-totter, this pivot point where this cylinder is, and this pin would have to uh, uh, keep it down with our classic uh, third-class lever here. So that negative uh, hope also makes sense. Well, if we look then at these two forces that are at right angles, we could use those. We could resolve those if we wanted to. I mean, if I were to turn those around, there's the AX. And let's see, AX would be going that way, and that one would be going that way. So I could resolve that into one force like that if I, I wanted to, and that would be the force that would be trying to shear through this pin. We'd have to maybe make a, a, a deal with a shear and bearing and all of those things. So with the pressure in the cylinder and these uh, forces here, uh, those numbers should help us a lot in the design of this. Now, uh, like we talked about in the, the problem that we did last lecture, I don't know that we have done an uh, exhaustive study of this thing. For instance, we at this orientation, we found what the pressure was, and we found what the uh, forces were at that pin. Could it be different? Yeah. If I look at uh, this going through its range of motions, we think about this going through its range of uh, motion. We'd really need to think about defining this angle instead of 30, but rather as theta, and look at our equations in, in an abstract sense. Now. 
and, and find out when this is at a maximum and when it's at a, a minimum. The other thing we might want to think about is this whole thing overturning. We don't want to get in a situation where we've designed this and the cylinder doesn't fail and the pin doesn't fail and the whole thing tips over. You could uh, see here that while this point here is maybe just inside that uh, wheel, if you lower it down, that point could get outside there and you could begin to have problems with it overturning depending on how much weight we have back there. So we certainly have not done a complete job of, of analyzing this, but uh, looked at, at one aspect of it. So as an engineer, you want to uh, if your if your task is to do this entire thing, maybe your task is just to find the force and the, the pressure in the cylinder. But if your task is to design the whole thing, you want to look at it as a as a comprehensive uh, piece and not only just design the pin and the cylinder, but ask the question: Is the whole thing going to tip over? What's the reaction here? What's the reaction there? Are the casters going to hold and, and things like that? So other things to to uh, think about. Maybe we'll just sum that up with lots more to look at. So we talked about uh, when things tip over. When, when would be the uh, thing when this would tip over? When this reaction, um, this reaction is equal to zero at tipping, isn't it? Mm, we could go through that analysis. I think you've got some homework problems like that. So just, just things to, to think about. Well, the last thing that I would like to look at today deals with Hooke's Law. And we'll see Hooke's Law in lots of different forms and the uh, terms to come. But we'll start with it like this. And we're going to talk about it in context for a, a spring. And say that Hooke's law is equal to, this is the, uh, the force is equal to K, that's the spring constant. And S is the uh, change in distance. Okay, so this is the spring constant, sometimes thought of as the spring stiffness, and S is the change in distance from the unstretched length of the spring. Sometimes they'll put a negative uh, in here, and that really depends on whether you're looking at the force on the spring or whether you're looking at the force on the body the spring is attached to. Let's try a very uh, a quick conceptual example here. Let's say that we have a spring that is uh, unstretched at this point here and we'll say that uh, K is equal to uh, 500 newtons per meter and the spring constant it has uh, units of force over distance so some common ones newton per meter or pounds per inch or pounds per foot okay so we've got newtons per meter and let's say someone comes along and they stretch this thing with some force and they stretch it 0 0.2 meters. Okay. So I'm going to have then my, by Hooke's law, the, the spring constant, 500 newtons per meter times 0 0.2 meters. And I get to cancel those and I come up with what, 100 newtons. Yeah. Okay, so I'd have 100 newtons and that would be in, in tension. And then here, let me try another example. Maybe someone uh, compresses this spring, and I realize a lot of springs are not necessarily made for both tension and compression, but we'll say ours, ours is here. So they compress the spring, and we'll say that they compress at this distance of minus 0 0.2 meters. So we could say this force was equal to, again, 500 newtons per meter times a distance now of minus 0 0.2 meters 
which gives me minus 100 newtons. And the negative indicates, of course, I mean the tension here is indicated by the positive. The negative uh, is indicating compression. Okay, I think we're okay there. Yeah, I think we're good here. We'll actually, uh, spring term, when we start thinking about um, strengths of materials, we'll look at uh, steel rods really as springs. I mean, if you look at a, a piece of uh, steel here, a steel rod that's got some uh, tension in it, it's really a spring. It has some stiffness. It's just a very stiff spring. And if you look then maybe at a, a piece of cable or something, it's also a spring. It's, it's just very uh, stiff, depending on its cross-sectional properties, its material properties, and things like that. So even something like a table leg, the table or the chair leg that you're sitting in, you're putting a compressive load in that, it has probably uh, got shorter in its dimension just, just slightly. It actually could be thought of as a very stiff spring. We'll be doing that spring term when we're talking about uh, non-rigid bodies. For now, the bodies that we're using are rigid, un unless it's a spring. Um, we're saying only the springs are going to deflect, but uh, later on we'll talk about really everything having some spring properties, although uh, a lot of them are very stiff. The other thing uh, to think about here is this is a two-force member. Okay, it's a two-force uh, member. So you've got uh, tension in it or compression in it. Well, let's try an example then. We'll go through this. Let's say that someone gives us uh, something like this. And so we've got this uh, wheel, if you will, and it's got a... Uh, a bearing here with a pin in it, nice uh, low friction bearing, and at some distance out from this, some distance D out from that, we've attached a string with some mass on it, and then at this point here we've attached a, a string or cable with a, a spring, and it will say the spring has some constant uh, K, has some unstretched length, and what I'd like you to imagine is that we, we're holding this thing at this at this point here, and the, the weight centered over there, and we just tap it ever so much this way, and you can imagine it's going to come to a new point of equilibrium. This mass is going to pull down. And it's going to have a, some weight force due to the mass, and this spring is going to be trying to pull back, and at some point here, some distance, this angle in here, some theta, this is going to come to rest again. I think you could hopefully imagine that when this started out and the, uh, the, uh, this point was up here, and then we just gave it just a little tap, and this thing rotated over to a new point of equilibrium. We'd like to, at this new point of equilibrium, find an expression for theta. How big is theta? How far did theta go? Well, again, free body diagram to the rescue here. Let's uh, look at this. So I'll draw this thing again. And I'm going to put a, a couple of forces here. I'm going to not even going to label them because I'm not interested in them. I don't know what they are. I'm going to have to. I'm going to try and avoid dealing with them. And I'll put this uh, point out here. This is going to be acting straight down. Now this is a mass, so I'm going to multiply the mass times the acceleration of gravity because our free body diagram is always a diagram of forces. It is never a diagram of masses. So multiply your masses times the acceleration. In this case, the acceleration of gravity, and put it on as a force. Then we have here the force of the spring, right? The force of the, uh, the spring. And if we wanted to, we could come up here. We've got this angle theta. We're told that the radius of this is r. Maybe I won't put this on the free body diagram because I don't want to put a distance on there and, and clutter it up. And then we likewise have that that distance there is uh, d. So if I look at this uh, little triangle that's that's made here, I've got a triangle that looks something like this, don't I? Where this angle here is that angle right there. That's theta. This is a right angle. That's the distance uh, d. So I could say that this was d times the sine of theta. Okay. So here's a good point to sum the moment about. Well, a good point to sum the moment about is right there. Maybe I'll call that point O. 
So I say that's point O. So if I sum the moment about O, setting that equal to zero, what do I get? I could say that I have the distance here, which is the radius. There's that perpendicular distance. So the radius times the force in the spring. Presumably the radius is constant all the way around. And that's going to go, we'll say that's positive. We'll take clockwise as positive. So then I will need to subtract off this mg times the distance that that acts through, which is that distance right there. I'm looking for that, that distance right there, which is d sine theta. Okay. And I've got then an equation where that is equal to zero. Because it was a great uh, decision to sum the moment about this point here because those forces intersect that point. I needn't worry about those two forces because their distance is zero. So I really only have to worry about this force here acting through this distance d sine theta and this force here acting through this distance r. So now I can go about uh, solving this equation. Except, what's the force in the spring? Well, let's see, the force in the spring is... Could I make a substitution for that? Well, I know Hooke's Law. It's equal to K times S, right? Well, what's S? Well, I could say that that S is the uh, distance. How far? What's the distance? Well, in this case, it's the arc length. So I could say that that was k times, how could I do the arc length? Wouldn't that be theta times r? Yeah, theta times r, that's the arc length. That's what s is equal to, as long as we put theta in radians. Okay. So with that, I could say that uh, 0 is equal to k times theta times r squared, because I have an r there and an r there minus mg times d times the sine of theta. Okay. And if I wanted to, I, I would need to then, then solve for theta. I, I think I will leave this at this point. Let me double check. 0 is equal to k theta r squared minus mg d sine theta. It gets to be kind of a hard problem. To solve much further than that because we have the unknown here as theta and we have the unknown in the argument of the sine. You could go through and try and solve it. Um, you might want to put it in a computer algebra system and ask you to uh, take this equation, throw it into a, uh, a computer algebra system, a MATLAB or MAPLE or maybe even your TI or something and have it come up with an expression for uh, what theta is. There's a if you really wanted to, you could find uh, theta. What you're going to do, and this is exactly what the computer algebra system does if you're using a numeric approach, is you'll guess a theta and see what the equation is. So you'll guess theta and the equation, and then guess another theta, and is the equation getting closer to zero? And we'll keep guessing this until we get pretty close to zero, because if we guess one way here and then we guess here and we've gone past, we know that we need to go back. And usually with about six or seven guesses, you can get pretty close. So I would guess an angle of theta, put it in here. Do I get zero? No, I'll guess, guess another angle. Am I getting closer or further away? And then I can refine those guesses. That's a, a, a root finding uh, technique. You could use, uh, I mean, we talked about using Excel to find roots last year for those of you that are around for the GE classes. So um, you can do this by hand. I've done it by hand with a half dozen. You can actually get pretty close because you're not going to start very far out. I mean, I'd probably start looking at the physical situation somewhere between about 45 and 22 degrees, somewhere in there. Take that one and, and go from there. So I won't belabor this anymore, but an expression like this can be kind of handy because it's good for a variety of, of angles. So if you're doing something that uh, could take on a variety of different angles, coming up with an expression like that is, is kind of nice. Well, springs in general are kind of uh, interesting uh, and probably worth thinking about. Let me make some final comments on those before we uh, wrap up for the, uh, the, the lecture of the day. And we've talked about a um, maybe a coil spring that seems the easiest to look at, and uh, we could put uh, tension on that or compression in that. If I look at a, a section of this, I take a, a section out of that and look at what's going on, 
in that uh, section. I really have uh, some torsion in there, don't I? I have something that's doing something like that, some torsion that's trying to twist that spring. So when we have torsion bar springs, really a, a coil spring is really just a torsion bar spring. And if you look at the uh, suspension on some vehicles, sometimes they'll use co uh, uh, coil springs. Sometimes they will use uh, torsion springs where they'll come back and they may, they may fix this end. And then we have a uh, torque or moment that could be applied uh, to that end. Maybe you've heard people uh, say they uh, torqued up their torsion bars. They give them a little more lift, uh, lift them up. You have to be careful of that. You start to really mess up the geometry and the intentions of the vehicle. But really this uh, coil spring is a torsion spring that's just been wrapped up so you can have a little different geometry. Of course there are uh, leaf springs. You get uh, one leaf spring or multiple leaf springs and uh, we could think about this and apply something here and have a uh, roller there and apply a force and that would deflect and that could have a spring rate um, also. Uh, speaking of the, the, the spring rate, if anyone's ever uh, rebuilt an engine, you look at the uh, springs, valve springs, which look a lot like this, and the question comes up, are your valve springs tired? Well, there's usually going to be some test. You'll put this in a uh, device, and it'll apply a given uh, force to this, and you'll measure how much that's gone down. And for a given force, if the deflection is not too much, the spring is probably okay, and you can put it back in. If the spring, if the deflection is too much, it's a tired old spring, and you're going to have to, to throw it out. And, um, how do you know uh, the material properties of the spring and whatnot? A lot of times the springs will be painted different colors, indicating uh, some of those, those properties, and uh, you have to go to the manufacturer's literature on that. But I just want to talk a little bit about different types of springs, leaf springs, torsional springs, and how a coil spring is really just a torsion spring that's been uh, wrapped up around there. So um, go ahead and uh, grab some equilibrium problems. Practice on those equilibrium problems. The last equilibrium problem that we have left to do is a three-dimensional uh, equilibrium problem, which uh, is really no more difficult, but maybe is, is tedious. And we're going to have to be very careful with our record keeping because it, it turns into kind of a long, tedious problem, but conceptually is no more difficult. So with that, I will uh, leave, you, leave you with that information, encourage you to, to work the homework problems. Uh, keep going on that as you prepare for the examinations. Thank you for watching, and take care until next time.